have uh, Ricardo Faraudo with DenFab joining us today. And uh, Ted Tennis is hopping on the call as well from out of Petisee. Um, so, Ricardo, uh, fortunately, you were uh, on the front end of this and actually mentioned it months ago, yeah. alluded to it. And you said, hey, Kent, you know, keep an eye out. The Friendly Nations visa is going to be shuffling a little bit. And that was in like, you know, October. So obviously that all happened about a week and a half ago. So I know folks want to know we're a week or so behind the announcement, but I waited my turn to get the expert. And Ricardo Faraulo is absolutely an expert with DenFab. They get the majority of our business for immigration customers because they know what they're doing. So Ricardo... Talk to me, Licenciado. Talk to us about the new Friendly Nations visa and how it's different mm -hmm. uh, to start with. Okay, yeah, this is, I mean, we initially, we did an article on this like around October, November, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the changes, uh, how we said they were going to be then are very similar to how they've been now. Uh, the main change uh, that is happening is that uh, currently, under the current law, uh, when you apply for a Friendly Nations visa, you get on an indefinite residency on the first application. So only the Tourist Pensionado visa and the Friendly Nations visa, and now the Red Carpet visa gave you that. But now, uh, with a change, you're first going to apply is for a two-year temporary residency, and you're going to get a two-year temporary ID. And then before that two-year temporary ID expires, exactly one month before, you can then apply for the indefinite residency. So it'll be more or less like two and a half years, and at that point, you apply for the indefinite residency. So within a th it, it will take a three-year time frame to obtain the indefinite residency ID. So that's one of the main changes going on with a Friendly Nations visa. Then after that, they have changed the requirements to qualify for the Friendly Nations visa. Uh, it used to be... Let me, sorry, let me just take a step back. So we've got three years now. It's two years, and then you start the solicitation of your permanent residence, and that could take, you're saying, about a year or so, right? Approx. Yeah, it's similar to how we currently have the economic solvency visa and most of the other type of visas. You first apply and obtain a six-month temporary ID while they process the visa. Then within those six months, they'll issue you your two-year temporary residency ID. Then you will return the six-month temporary ID, obtain the two-year temporary ID, and you'll have a two-year residency. Versus... Sorry, I'm just, and I apologize for cutting you off, uh, versus how it is currently, which people have what, like, is it 45 days before the new law goes into effect? Did I read that right? Or three months? Uh, yeah, it's 90 days from 90 where days. the law was issued. I've calculated that you have until August 17th to apply. On the okay. On current law. Which is what? You, you come in and you can automatically get your, so how does it? I always forget. I can't keep all these visas straight, man. Okay. So I got experts so, are surrounding me. So, yeah. So to clarify or, or elaborate on your question. Uh, so right now you apply and you receive a six month temporary ID, same as you will after the change. But when the visa is issued, you will get an indefinite residency ID where uh -huh. after the law is changed, you will get is a two year temporary residency ID. Ah, OK. But. The two years will then later translate to indefinite, right? Correct. So okay. after the two years, That's a you do another application where you show uh, the same requirements you did on the initial application. And at that time, they'll give you the indefinite residency ID. Okay. So those are similar. I mean, I guess it, the inconvenience reading between the lines is, all right, I have to come back in, in the middle of that process, whereas I didn't used to, right? Like that's... Correct. Another so, one. so okay. it, it's it's two residency applications to get the indefinite Versus. ID. Where now is one, and and obviously in that you have to come to Panama several more times because it's you have to always come for the application and then to obtain the residency ID, and then you have to do it again for the second application and then for the second the indefinite ID at the end. Okay, so like three or four visits versus like one to three. Okay, cool. Yeah. 
All right. So there's there's the difference between how it's going to roll out. But now you were starting to talk about uh, requirements, and those those are the big Correct. changes, right? Correct. Well, I mean, it's a, it's it's a different qualification. Uh, they have maintained more or less. You used to the the current law, and just so we're all clear, the current law is the law before the change. When I mention the current law, that's what I'm referring because it's still the law until August 18th. Right. So under under the current law, you have to show your economic purpose, and it, it's a little vague how you show your economic purpose, but it provides two ways. It provides one, which is through a job, basically summarizing so you show you have an employment letter you show that the company is registered as an operation permit etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, that is maintained you can still apply under that showing that uh, but then the other part was that you were able to qualify uh, showing that you had your own company so what we did was we registered a corporation where you were in the board of directors and you were a shareholder and with that you were able to qualify for for the residency. So for most people, this was the way they did it because, as you know, getting a job without having a work permit can be tricky, or without even having a residency. So generally, this was not uh, that easy. So it was better to just do a corporation, show show that. Then once you got the residency, then you were able to process the work permit, and then it was easier to get a job. Okay. Right. So okay. now with the change, you can still apply with the work letter and showing all the documentation from the company. But the other alternative that they bring in is they take out the option of showing that you have a corporation and then they bring a real estate investment option. So basically they say that if you uh, show that you have purchased or own a property that is worth $200,000 or more in your personal name in the public registry, you will be able to qualify for this residency. Okay. Okay. Um, as now, the requirement, it's like the old ones are gone. Now you literally, you have to buy property. Is that right? Like for the that is. So to be clear, so for the friendly nation visa, there are two options where you can qualify. Number Sorry. one, if you have a a, 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 a a job that can provide a work letter, uh, right. operation permit, uh, they've even included actually that you also, to be approved, you must have the work permit. So that means that you have to apply for residency, apply for the work permit, you know, provide all the documentation for the work permit, which includes social security, all that. Uh, so you must have a formal real job uh, within what the law allows and you could apply if you don't yeah. have, if, you, if you don't have that then you can also do but do it by investment the right. way you do it by investment is by buying a property for two hundred thousand dollars or more now the interesting thing kent here is that previously all the different uh real estate investment laws did not allow for the property or those two hundred thousand dollars or the three hundred thousand dollars which is the case in the economic solvency or the red carpet to be oh, financed yeah, okay yeah. so in this sounds good yeah in this one you can purchase through financing so right let's say if you're able to obtain financing you could put let's say a hundred thousand dollars down and finance a hundred thousand as long as the property is worth two hundred thousand dollars that will qualify now we know getting financing without residency isn't that easy but right. but at least it, it does allow that okay so all right. Yeah. And that's, that's so far. I'm, I'm I get you. Um, now here's where the fun part comes in and, and these questions actually kind of came from Ted and I was like, man, I definitely can't answer those. So let's get an expert on, I'm going to have Ricardo on Facebook live. Why don't you join us? So I got a list of questions. Um, okay. trying to anticipate what people might ask. My first question, and this came from Ted, is, well, what about pre-construction? Is there a way to register the promise to purchase agreement such that, all right, it's in the registry. I don't own it yet, but I have, yeah, like, will that qualify you? Because I know not what the red carpet visa, yeah. Not for this type of residency. Not for this one, okay? You can, you can do it for the red carpet, and it has to be $300,000. Okay. It, there's still a list of countries. Did that list expand? 
Uh, no, it did not expand. I believe it, it stayed pretty much the same. They might have made like one change, but I know for a fact they were trying not to change the list or add or detract. So uh, I think maybe they took one country out, but I'm not sure. But it's pretty much the same list. Okay, my my last question, and I'll let Ted uh, throw it out a few here. Um, was a hold on just a sec. Was it? Uh, yeah, I mean, other than real estate agents, of course, we love the fact that now you know 200k gets you like uh, gets you in the running, gets you qualified. Potentially, that could mean more um, sales for the. For us, for the economy, et cetera, I'm sure that promoters were pulling on Nito's ears a little bit and saying, hey, let's do this, let's do this. But who else Who else benefits from this? Who else is really happy about this? Like individual cases, countries, it feels like it gets a lot more tricky to get a, a, a visa because then you're going to exclude people that really don't want to buy property um, and can't get a job, i.e. retirees that – just come here to rent for years and they go out oh, to nice but restaurants. Retirees, and... retirees still have the pensional visa. Pensional. Which is a very easy, I mean, for the retirees from the North American countries that generally have a good pension system showing a thousand dollars or more yep. uh, is generally a, a easy requirement. Uh, okay. The main thing, and, and I, I mean, we, this was basically what was my point of the article back in October and November. Uh, the that article and that coincided with when they issued the red carpet visa. Okay, so this kind of goes hand in hand with the red carpet visa. It's not just happening by coincidence because currently you have the red carpet visa that calls for an investment of three hundred thousand dollars or more to obtain an indefinite residency. Right. So if you have that, who's gonna go for the red carpet visa when they can obtain indefinite residency without doing any sort of investment, right? So one thing that you have to understand is we as a country are going to provide the best product to the red carpet visa to the people who invest. So the friendly nations can't be the best product. It has to be ah. number two. Okay, All so right. it kind of little change of order, most attractive. It's still pensionado, but now it's red carpet visa because it's pensionado faster for the retirees. You know, but if you're going to do an investment now, you have the option of going through the friendly nations visa. If you don't have three hundred thousand dollars cash to put in a property, you can put two hundred thousand. You can even finance, uh, and you can obtain residency. But you're going to have to do a two-year temporary residency, and then you're going to do a secondary application for the indefinite residency, which okay. is the same procedure that we currently have on the economic solvency visa, which requires a $300,000 investment. So this is definitely a better product for the people from the nationalities on the countries uh, on the list than what we used to have in the economic solvency visa. All right? But obviously, if you're going for $300,000, Right now, probably the red carpet is a better product. Uh, the red carpet is also a more expensive visa, not just in what you invest, but also in the cost of application, what you have to pay the government. So this then becomes an option for the client. I think overall, they make sense together, right? So you have a client that can't afford $300,000 and is willing to pay $15,000, $20,000 for the residency application without having to come to Panama, red carpet visa. Now you have yep. another client who can purchase a property for two hundred thousand dollars or more and doesn't want to spend three hundred thousand uh, dollars, fifteen twenty thousand dollars on the procedure. They can do the friendly nations visa and just take a little longer to get the indefinite residency. I think that's more or less how it it works. And you do have to consider when you're analyzing this also as not just Panama but with other countries. No other country had a visa that you didn't have to invest anything to get. You know what I mean? So this is really a product that was there. I think when it was issued, probably like eight, nine years ago, it had an intent. Uh, we, we needed a lot of foreign workforce for many companies, um, but also times have changed and, and with uh, the ways uh, big countries are 
uh, US, Europe, they're seeing you know, how to cramp down on tax avoidance and all these. Uh, the friendly nations visa was not the best looked at for Panama as a country because it could also be perceived for a way for foreigners to avoid tax uh, by getting residency and doing these things without having to be here or do an investment or anything. So there's different reasons why it was changed at the end. I mean, uh, it's been here for a while. All these visas and residencies have like a lifespan. I mean, I, sure. I think since like five years ago, I've been saying like, hey, apply. You know, you never know when they're going to take this away. The end so, is coming. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, well, Ted, what did you have any questions about kind of uh, implications of this or how it works or, you know, how a property might qualify or anything like that? I, I Yeah, I have a couple of questions, Ricardo, and thanks for your expertise on this. I've learned a lot just listening to you so far. Yeah, same. Um, what I would ask, first of all, is there, there, I know that I have clients and I know that I'm working with folks who are surprised by this. They might have heard about something, but when it finally became, hey, this is happening, now they're scrambling a little bit. Has your, first of all, I guess my first question is, has your firm seen an uptick in the amount of people that are applying and trying to get in under the wire? And then part two of that question is, what would you say to those people? It, do you think it's too late? We've got maybe 80 days left or something like that. I mean, clearly somebody has to get a bank account open. They've got to form a company and they have to mostly go and get their documents in a row in their home country to bring down. Yeah. What, what, what's your take on this? Okay, yeah. Uh, well, initially, uh, back in October and November, when we first saw that this was going to happen, one of my uh, main comments uh, was that they had to, once they issued the law, it couldn't go into effect like immediately. Like, because there's people who are here. Let's say I have clients that are here, arrive today and are going to apply tomorrow and you, you change the law today. So that was one of my uh, main comments, actually. You had to give a grace period of three months to six months. So luckily they did take this into consideration. Not that it's just my comment. Probably other people had the same comment. But uh, so they gave a 90 day period, which, you know, it, it, if you add it to the initial notice we had from October and November and all that, I think the, the, the time frame has been uh, good. Uh, as you mentioned, we definitely have had an uptick. Obviously, uh, I think if the pandemic hadn't happened, uh, this law would have changed a long time ago. Uh, so, and, and there's many, many clients that haven't come to apply because of the pandemic. And since I issued the, the initial article in October or November saying that this was going to happen, there's been an uptake. There's been a lot of people coming to apply, understanding that this is going to change. Uh, and definitely now that they actually changed the law, I mean, it's a little crazy, as you can imagine. Yeah. Uh, but I, I had a lot of clients who had already done the bank account and the corporation and have many things. And there's just a matter of, you know, we're working on their documents. And it's just like now like, they're setting going. their date to come here to Panama to apply. Uh, I think that on that, I, note, first on that note, Ricardo, what is the what is the requirement to get in under the wire on this? If you want to take advantage of the current law, what do you have to do to make sure that your stamp is before? You know what I mean? You have to apply. So in order to apply, you have to comply with all the requirements. The requirements are, you know, to, to number one, your nationality. Number two, you have to show your financial solvency. You do that with a Panamanian account. Uh, that's something that we help our clients obtain. And number three, you have to show that you own a corporation which we also do by registering a Panamanian corporation. We put you in the board of directors and your shareholder. Those are the three main things to apply. Uh, then the common or, you know, requirements for all the types of residency you also have to meet, which are police clearance from your country of residence for the last two years. That has to be apostilled. Uh, and if you're going to bring dependents, such as a wife or children, marriage certificate, uh, birth certificate, apostilled as well. So... Answering your final question, if I think people can still get in. Yes, I think people can still get in. If you write me today, uh, I'll still accept your, your, your case. Uh, but I think the, the, the window for that is shrinking. Uh, yeah. I'm actually setting a bar 
that I will only work with clients that are arriving prior to August 3rd. Now, when you arrive, you must already have the corporation register, which we do by email. We do the pre-approval of the bank account by email. So when you arrive, basically you open the bank account on the first day, and then you must arrive with the original documents uh, ready and apple steeled. Now that might, might be the most challenging part, and that varies from country to country, because some countries right. are really quickly, and some countries are really slow. So that's the part that depends on where you're from. Uh, so I think that even like, for example, if you're in the US and you're in Canada, if you're in Europe, you're, you could still apply. I mean, I'm receiving clients yesterday and we're moving forward, but uh, the, the, you really have to act, I would say now, start now, like first to get this started within the first two weeks of June. Uh, and that would leave us more or less a month and a half where you get the documents, where we do the other stuff and you come to Panama to apply. Okay, great. And and then thank you for that. So you to apply, you have to be here physically in person. Yes. Right. So part of this process is get here before that cutoff date in plenty of time to be able to go in and, and be physically present at immigration with all of your ducks in a row, all of your paperwork, your corporation, your bank account, your Apple Steel documents. And then, yes, this still could happen if you wanted to, but you better get started now. Correct. Okay. So, so I have a follow-up question. I don't know how much time you have. Uh, Shoot. Cool. Thank you. Um, let's say you don't do that, and now you want to take advantage of this new uh, limit, which is $200,000 investment in property, specifically property. Uh, it can be financed by a bank. What are the requirements for financing? Uh, my, my take, when, when I read the law and I saw it says financed by a bank, I think, okay, private financiers are not going to be able, even ones that are licensed and bonded that aren't banks are not going to be able to lend money to people and qualify for this. Do you have a read on that yet? Or is it too early to tell? Exactly the law is very clear that it says it has to be financed by a bank. It has to be a bank. That's what the law says. You read it. Yeah. I read it same as you. And, and, and that's what it is. When the law yeah. specifies something that clear, it is like that. Okay. Even developer financing. I mean, so the law. OK, so jumping in here, Ted, and I want you to keep with your questions because they're good. Um, what are the odds of them pushing this back, Ricardo, and saying, well, OK, I mean, laws, laws generally have uh, amendments done to them. I mean, generally, when you do a decree like this, uh, people will come in with some feedback. And sometimes you get amendments. Most of the laws generally have amendments later. Uh, yeah. So that is very common. I mean, I if you... Say, I could say, for example, see, one, one amendment, I mean, that I can quickly point out is that it specifically says in your personal name. All right? So, so that in itself means you have to buy under your name. You know, you can't buy in a corporation, you can't buy in a foundation. Uh, so that could be something that could be maybe reviewed and changed going forward uh, because red carpet allows for buying under a corporation. Economic solvency allows for buying under a, a private interest foundation. Um, so maybe that is amended. But in regards to financing, it does say specifically by a bank. Yeah. Now, uh, maybe that is amended. Maybe there's a reason why they put a bank. Uh, you know, but for example, if it were, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it does really seem to take out like private financing. Developer financing. I mean, there's tons of guys right now that have developer financing. Uh, yeah, but know. the developer financing it doesn't work anyway, Ken, because when you're using developer financing, the property's not in your name. It's on the name right. of the developer. Yeah. The they property has to be in your name. So the developer will yeah. have to transfer. And then, you know they won't be able to transfer without paying off the loan. So that, that, that's not going to. Are, are you hearing any talk and the superintendency because, you know, banking lending restrictions, I feel like have just gotten pretty onerous, onerous in the last couple of years. Um, is there yeah, any, opening up a bank right now is super tough. Well, yeah. And it kind of has been bank for a long time, but harder now, let alone harder. getting pregnant. harder. Huh? Yeah. And so it's like, are banks also aligned with trying to open things up a little bit because of this law or are they, is there any vested interest in them? Kind of like the, the government says, okay, we impose these, 
these strict compliance rules on you. We're going to, we're going to release a few uh, just to allow people to actually take advantage of, you know, financing, bank account openings, et cetera. Well, number one, I think the strict compliance come more than just because of the superintendency. The strict compliance also come from international pressures from international countries. Sure. Uh, at the end of the day, as you as you are well aware, uh, you know we are, you know, our bank system is determined by the sponsor <laughs> banks who provide allow us to do wire transfers, and they set the rules of the game. I think it's that simple, and and and, and Panamanian banks have to, uh, you know, do what they say. Um, so you know, this is not necessarily like Panama is doing this. I think that banks, yes, it is dif difficult to obtain financing, but banks, you know, independently, they don't work together necessarily. They set their rules, but each bank sets, you know, internally what they want as a client and they do not want as a client at the moment. And those things vary from time to time. You sometimes hear of a bank that, hey, you hear, hey, they're financing more, you know, and others might not, you know, so that changes with, with time. Right now, obviously, because of the pandemic, I think that banks are going to be extra careful. There's still the moratorium period that's going to end. You know, they have to see how that ends. Uh, I, 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 I think, you know, at the end of the day, I don't know if you if you know, but I, I worked in a bank for three years, you know, went through all these departments and know pretty much well how banks work. And at the end of the day, banks work. They don't finance based on collateral. They finance based on your income. If you're a client and you can show recurrent income, you should be able to obtain financing. They might not finance you 70%, but they can finance you 50 and that's still pretty good. I mean, it all depends on your income, your recurrent income. Obviously, your recurrent income is always more difficult for people who have their own business. Uh, you know, and it even happens to me. I have my own law firm. When you come to a bank for a loan, you're not the standard client. The standard client is the guy who works for a big company and has a salary and the company can provide a work letter. Um, so that's how it works. But this changes from time to time. Uh, and I think I think that it's important that the law allowed for it because right now you might say, hey, it's difficult. But the law is going to be here for a couple of years. So and, and, and this is constantly changing. OK, cool. Yeah, thank you for that. Ted, you got any other questions? For the, the Just the last one is just a, uh, a follow up to the first couple, which is, OK, let's assume that someone is ready to buy a property that's 200 plus. They don't want to do the red carpet. They're going to do this new one, mm -hmm. uh, which is the it's called the modified friendly nations requirement. So it's the same application process, uh, but instead of having to have a company, that's no longer a requirement. They have to have what? A, a certificado, a certificate from the public registry showing they own a property in Panama that has that's at least two hundred thousand. Yeah, I mean th that means that they own a property. Uh, when, when you when you buy a property, and it's registered to your name, you get the public deed. But at any time, then you can go to a public registry and request a public registry certificate. Public registry that's of the property, and the public registry issues a certification that shows who the owner is, shows the registered value. And that's basically how you prove it. Right, exactly. So in other words, let's say I have a property uh, that I, uh, I've owned for 10 years and it's in my name and it's worth more than 200. I can just slide that in and apply for this residency. Yeah. Doesn't have to be a new purchase. No. But if I have it in a corporation, I'd have to transfer it into my own name <laughs> and pay yes. the taxes on that. Right now, yes. Yeah. But it's interesting, actually, because of what you mentioned. Uh, the other laws, uh, red carpet and economic solvency, always have a, a phrase that says that you not only have to show the 200000 in this case, but you have to show that that money came from outside of Panama. And, um, and that is generally quite interesting how you show it and makes it difficult, for example, to do what you just mentioned, like, hey, I bought a property 10 years ago and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use it. You, could, you might meet that requirement then when I tell you, hey, but you, we also have to show those funds came from outside of Panama. Showing that you brought those funds from outside of Panama from 10 years ago is difficult. Uh, but this, this amendment doesn't say that. So it, 
seems you know fairly easy you all need to show us a public registry certificate yeah well and theoretically you know people are going to be using this piece of buying new properties uh for the most part it'll be interesting to see how this all shakes out with the uh with the little details like that yeah i mean at the end obviously i understand i i you know uh we have mainly done friendly nations visa over the last 10 years uh it's going to be interesting how the market shakes up but i you know i think that we have different products that are attractive uh i also hope that soon uh we improve our passport product because right now it's pretty poor the one we have uh hopefully they'll issue a new law that provides also an option that you can invest and obtain a passport immediately which would be very attractive uh, but the red carpet is very attractive i mean uh you 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 definitely need to understand that not you know one it's it, it's unbelievable but one of the main issues or questions or obstacles that i always get from clients when they write me initially i want to obtain residency and they ask me over and over again but do i have to go to apply do we all really need to go to apply you know coming to apply is an obstacle for people most people want to obtain residency in a country without even going there it seems unbelievable but it's it's really how it is uh, and and the red carpet provides this option and provides this option at $300,000, which, you know, seems with the world we're living in, it's not that much money anymore. Um, or many people qualify for this market uh, and range of, of you know, investment. Uh, and is in line with what other countries' uh, visa residency programs are. So, so I think the red carpet is very attractive for a market of people that want to obtain residency, then that, that, that quickly want to do it because, uh, as you mentioned, for example, I think one thing important that people need to understand is that buying a property, as you guys know, and I know, but a new a person listening to this doesn't know, takes months, uh, several months, right? To get in your personal name, you know, yeah. if the seller has a mortgage, you know, it's just even if you have the cash, you know, a, a real estate transaction can take at least two, three, four months uh, to get finalized. So <laughs> that in itself takes a while. Uh, in the red carpet visa, like uh, Ken mentioned before, you have the option of buying it from the developer. You can just send the funds to the developer. Well, not really the developer. You have to send it to a trust who then provides a certification. So you're, it's like an escrow. Your money's secure. Uh and immediately you qualify and you apply. Uh, so if, if you have the funds ready available, I mean, this could be the turnaround could be very quick. Uh, so it, it, I find it to be very attractive. Uh, but then the friendly nations with the new law, with a new change, then becomes attractive for the people that don't qualify for that. So I think you have two different products. They also issued a very interesting temporary uh visa for this remote workers nomad market which is an 18 month uh residency where you really don't have to show much just like that you are receiving i believe four thousand dollars or more per month from a foreign company uh, and you can come and live in panama for 18 months and work from here uh and i think that's attractive and that could potentially uh get a guy who wants to then invest uh, and buy a property and stay here? Uh, they issued that one. That's I, I think that's a very a very good residency option, and and there's also the reforestation which they tweet uh, for eighty thousand dollars. So there's different options, and the pensionado for the retiree market still uh, they hasn't been changed, and I think it's still a really good option. Definitely, globally the pensionado visa is super competitive and still very attractive. Um, so. Question about the red carpet visa, because, you know, guys and Ricardo, respecting your time, Ted as well. Um, Ricardo is a lot of times the first stop uh, in people's research process before they even get to Ted and I on the real estate side is, okay, how do I even get into Panama legally? So I'm super curious in the last couple of months since the red carpet visa has been rolled out or four or five, six months even, um, are you seeing an uptick in, in a few countries? that maybe didn't qualify qualify for the friendly nations visa or are you seeing as much business as you were thinking you were going to see i think well number one i think now that they taking out the friendly nations visa we're going to see much many more red carpet visa applications uh 
uh, even, you know, if you contacted me three months ago and said, do I do red carpet or friendly nations? <laughs> you know, I present you case A, case B, and, you know, uh, more people will always choose to go with the one that has, uh, is less expensive or, you know, you don't have to show that your investment for five years, etc. cetera. Uh, so you probably wind up do doing a friendly nations visa. But I do think that going forward, we're going to see more red carpet visa applications. Uh, I think it's 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 very attractive for also, uh, like I said, I mean, for people that don't want to have to come to Panama, um, for, at least initially for the application. Um, and I think I'm forgetting uh, what you mentioned for the second part of your question. Um, no, if that's if it's opened up any particular nationalities oh, or you yeah. notice okay. trends. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, for example, one country that comes to mind is Peru. Uh, you know, Peru is starting to have a lot of inquiries uh, because of their presidential situation over there. Uh, Colombia is always an interesting market in residency in Panama, uh, and the red carpet visa is a good option. Uh, Salvador might also become a very important market. So, yeah, it does open up. Uh, I mean, we always had the economic solvency that it was $300,000. But let's just say that the red carpet, first of all, provides you an indefinite residency. I mean, the economic solvency, you, you had to apply for two years and, you know, come like four times. Like I said, coming to Panama, whether, you know, I understand it or not, is for most people... They want to apply and obtain residency without having to go to that country or go the least amount of times. Least so, amount of times. So yeah. in the red carpet, they can come once. That's it. And then just once every two years to keep it. So, you know, that's very attractive for many people. 100%. Um, well, Ted, you know, uh, Ricardo usually, I mean, he's got Nito Cortizo on like WhatsApp. Ricardo's yeah. connected. Um, do you have any suggestions uh, while the law is being debated or not even debated, it's already been approved, but while the law is being talked about by the community and stakeholders and people that are going to be enforcing it, um, any, any thoughts on any kind of amendments that we'd like to get out to Ricardo to get to his people? <laughs> I don't know about amendments. I, Ricardo mentioned the big one that comes to mind, which is I, I don't understand exactly why they want the property to be in some in a, in a persona natural, you know, someone's name as opposed to in some sort of uh, corporation or foundation. That would be maybe there's a good reason for that, but I'd like to know, you know, what the thought process is and see if they would open it up. I think that would be attractive to a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people like having corporations and foundations for other reasons. Uh, that have nothing to do with residency. Um, so that would be good to know if that could be broadened. And I guess the other one would just be simply to wait and see how this, uh, how, the, how the application of it works. We've just talked about what I consider to be, you know, uh, an interesting dilemma of source, which is, hey, you don't have to invest $200,000. If you can go out and get a bank loan, uh, you can invest whatever plus the bank loan and if it adds up to 200 which sounds amazing until you realize how difficult it is to go through that process with the banks yeah. well i mean look uh when they initially did the friendly nations visa one of the requirements for the friendly nations visa was to have a bank account with five thousand dollars or more and most of the banks i went to to help my clients were like oh one of the standard requirements is residency id so i'm like all right what do we do here? You know, like it's a catch 22 situation. Like we can't get the bank account without residency ID. I can't get the residency ID without bank account. So, you know, I think banks are private entities and they are more willing to work with people uh, when situations like this appear. So I think maybe right now it's very rigid, like difficult to get a mortgage uh, without having residency. Uh, but you know, as this law goes and people, you know, knock in banks' doors and say, like, hey, I want to apply for this. Uh, I want to get financing so I can buy the property. Uh, maybe the banks will be more lenient. Maybe, you know, require a letter from the lawyer, a letter from the realtor, and letters from all the people involved, maybe. Uh, but maybe, you know, this will open up a bit. 
and maybe they'll require more down payment. Maybe they'll give you a higher interest rate. I don't know, but you know, it will be an option. Loosen it up a little bit. Yeah, no, hopefully. Cool. Well, I don't have any other questions. Um, so yeah, and I don't see anything on the chat here. So Ted, uh, I think, uh, we'll, Ricardo, thank you, man. We really do appreciate you. You know, you still get the lion's share of our immigration business because uh, you and your firm are fantastic. So thank you for making the time, sir. Of course, Kent, anytime. And it's been a while. You know, right? Write me. I'm, I'll be happy to do this many times. Yeah, before. 100%. All right, cheers. Uh, well, right. thanks to, to both you guys. Hasta pronto. And uh, yeah, everybody have a good afternoon. Thanks, guys.